so absolutely great time for um organizations to look at how coaching will take them to the next level uh, whether organizations like amazon and all forward looking um institutions how do they leverage the individual values and what they are looking forward to and what an organization needs so you know both of the bottom lines have to come together no better place than coaching and the systemic organization lens magda adding value part for 2 minutes so uh I, a lot of you in the audience I know, and I know you have credentials, good for you, awesome. For those of you who have just your ACC, or maybe you know somebody with your, with just who has the ACC, or maybe you want to get all of your requirements for renewal done in one go, because you're a very organized and mature human being. You're not gonna email me in December saying, hey Magda, help. If that sounds like you, uh, we have some exciting new things starting. So in their infinite wisdom, ICF, you know, keeps changing life. And sometimes it's confusing. Sometimes it just, you know what, every time it's inspirational in terms of helping us um, invent new stuff to meet the requirements and make them awesome. So in this particular case, there are some changes around accreditation levels and the whole ACTP, ACSDH, all that is going away and it's going to now be, you know, one path to ACC, one path to PCC, one path to MCC, happy days. So because these things are changing, we thought we would um, also take a look at how we do our electives, which as you may recall are 30 hour programs. We started about a year ago, a year and a half, something like that. And um, what we're going to experiment with is kind of expanding on those electives. So right now you do coaching foundation with us or you have your ACC and then you can join Coacharia for advanced and mentored evaluation. Because of the ICF changes, we have to change our structure a tiny bit to uh, make sure that we are, you know, gelling with the requirements and whatnot. But what that's, what's cool about this is it opens up opportunity for us to rethink what advanced looks like. So instead of just having an advanced, what we're going to experiment with is advanced with a particular focus. So for example, I'm not sure if she's going to be in the panel today, but one of our lovely coaches, Pooja, is going to be doing an advanced program with a focus on organizational coaching. Um, our lovely Cindy, who if any of you ever wanted to train with Cindy, this is a great opportunity for you to do it. Cindy is going to run a program that's technically advanced with a focus on executive coaching. So if you want to do executive coaching, you will have a chance to work with one of the best, if not the best mentors on the planet, our lovely Cindy. And I'm saying this objectively as well as subjectively, because like, honestly, anyone in the audience, if you have trained with Cindy or interacted with her on mentor evaluation, please honestly, just in the chat, let us know whether I'm right or not. Cause I think I am like Cindy's freaking phenomenal. So, um, She's doing this program that's going to be 30 hours of class time. Plus, depending on whether you want to do it as a continuing education or if you want to do it as a requirement um, in lieu of advanced, so you can apply for your PCC, then there's going to be additional work and it's going to be a 65 hour program um, for you. ICF now allows 50 50 synchronous asynchronous learning. So for us, that means that we can have a 30 hour synchronous contact hour program, but the participants can use that, um, can do extra work essentially and get an evaluation, et cetera, meet all the requirements and, and use that uh, course either to renew credential or to get their next one. So it means more flexibility and also means that you can you know, hang out with Cindy when you otherwise wouldn't get to. So to make a very, very long story short, if you ever want to train with Cindy and or if you are an executive coach, there is gonna be a program that we're starting that's 30 contact hours. It'll start at the end of April and it'll be focused on executive coaching. There'll be another one with Pooja focused on um, organizational coaching. 
Uh, I know that Tracy, who you would have seen a lot too, will be doing one on wellness coaching later in the year. So look out for things like that. And my big request is that if there's a particular area of coaching that you think this kind of approach would work for really well, please email me because right now is when we're doing our planning of what kind of advanced um, programs we're going to offer. So if there's something that you really want to pursue, let me know and we can make it happen. Cool. All right. Rich. This is Neha's fault. She told me to come. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome no, absolutely. Yeah, you welcome I everyone. I, I, got, I got Magda yeah, here today. <laughs> yeah, I completely endorse what you said about Cindy. And these electives have been a dream for a long time that we don't want to stick to the plain vanilla, uh, the ICF standards of just PCC and ACC. We want to incorporate multiple other things which people would like to learn be it executive coaching, organizational coaching, systemic ontology, whatever it may be. And so there's a great opportunity for two people to specialize in what they would like to make in, as a niche in terms of coaching later and be trained for it and get the credentials as well. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, Neha, all, your, Neha, all yours. You can start and I, I'm here at your disposal. Thank you, Magda. <laughs> Thank you, Ram. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Magda. All right. Hello, everyone. You know, I just have to say, Ram, that I'm always so surprised, pleasantly surprised and amazed by the fact that we have such an international audience. We have people signing in from Switzerland, France, Bangalore, Rio, Johannesburg, Dubai. Wow. It's, uh, it's quite a privilege. UK, Pune, amazing. It's just beautiful to be here with, with all of you. And uh, today, well, today we were actually going to have um, someone, but you know, there's a pandemic, go pandemic going on and emergencies happen. So unfortunately we couldn't be by our guest. So you have me and Ram today to hang out with you and uh, we might be joined by another um, trainer a little bit later. But today we're going to be talking about shaping the corporate world or shaping corporate culture through systemic team coaching. Uh, Ram, I'd love to hear from you, first of all, maybe even just I'm sure everyone would like to know uh, what really is systemic coaching? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, before that, uh, I just want to apologize. Uh, and he apologized. Mahesh uh, Medekar is the CHRO of Daimler uh, in India. He was about to join and just about an hour, two hours before um, when we were, we were scheduled to start, he, his, his family, wife and son were affected, his daughter fell ill with COVID as well. So he just couldn't do anything but to sort of stay with her. Um, and so uh, sincere apologies that uh, he's not here, but we would have him another day. Uh, one of the things I really wanted to uh, sort of uh, bring out is that uh, the systemic coaching is not just a mere theory. It's something that is uh, so seriously uh, application oriented. And uh, in Daimler, uh, Mahesh and his cohort, they're actually applying the systemic work uh, to various levels of management. So I really wanted them to speak about it. But anyway, we, we've talked today with uh, Neha about uh, uh, some of the things that we are doing with systemic coaching. And what are the trends? What is happening? We I have spoken in the past as well. I just want to start with a conversation that I had recently, a few days ago, with uh, Peter Hawkins, my mentor, and who is uh, one of the gurus of uh, the systemic concept. Uh, many of you might have heard of him. He's uh, about to release his latest book, one of many, which is called uh, Coaching from ego to eco or something like that, ego to eco coaching. It's all about uh, climate change and stuff like that, how we can get over the, the blind spots uh, that we have um, to understand and be aware of what's happening around us and to be able to do something about it. And uh, we have invited him. And so in one of the future webinars, uh, he would be participating here along with probably a few others in that group, Eve Turner and others, uh, hopefully. Uh, so when we started talking about various things, I was asking Peter, hey, uh, 
And Peter was telling me that, look, uh, and it's something very similar to me in terms of, yeah, uh, at, at some point in time, you would like to do something, uh, maybe, I, I wouldn't say more meaningful, whatever we are doing now is extremely meaningful, but uh, something of much broader significance than uh, just working with uh, moving into credentials and something which perhaps could create uh, a much larger movement, inspiration and stuff like that. Uh, in a way, uh, for me, the torchbearer for that and the standard is uh, Otto Schama and his theory. Uh, the kind of influence that's provided, the inspiring approach um, and touching millions of people today and the millions of people in turn touching probably, hopefully, at some point in time, billions of people. So Peter was telling me when we started talking about it, he said, yeah, you know, even when people say that they are being systemic and they are being, uh, let's say they have a larger consciousness than what about themselves, but they always start with themselves first, uh, not with uh, what we would call moving from uh, the self to a much larger space, but is there a way that we can bring them from the larger space into the individual so that that's what influences? So I told him that uh, one of the things that I've been experimenting with is in my cohorts, and there are some of you from my cohort here uh, in the last couple of years, and especially for the last two years, I've been starting with this particular question uh, in the beginning of every program. Uh, please reflect on what does the universe want you to be during this journey of about nine to 10 months, or whatever that period of journey that is going to happen between us. And initially there is a bit of a confusion. Yeah, what do you mean? What does the universe want of me? And then there's a discussion in terms of what's the difference between what do I want, which perhaps others in the universe may approve, which is still coming up from, let's say in a sense, the personal greed, personal desire, good, bad, whatever. And in this particular case, it's genuinely an acceptance that there's a larger energy that governs us, controls us. You don't have to denominate it as uh, a religious entity or a God, whatever it is, it's just an energy. And then say, if everything is possible in that infinite potential that exists out there, what Aristotle called the potentiality, the immense and inexhaustible potentiality, where all possibilities exist of the present, past and the future in every space, which is not bound by space or time. What does it have there out there too often? And out of that, what am I going to choose? And it's not as simple as I say, obviously. And from there, we move into a discussion on a concept that we have developed. And I had practiced for several years during my monastic training and so on, who was about creating your future, which is based at one level on this larger potentiality that's available, looking at the plentitude rather than the scarcity. At the same time, trying to figure out what are we good for? And in this, one of the multiple methods are available. What I've used is usually look at what is it that gives us joy? What is it that gives us happiness? And also what are our strengths and putting them together to see, is there a pathway out there which gives us an opportunity for us to move forward? And based on that, we move to a short-term, near-term set of objectives. And then I always say that move into a much larger, much more distant objective, which may be seemingly confusing, not very clear. But even if it's fuzzy, can you look 30 years ahead of you or 40 years ahead of you, wherever you are? And I used at that, that time 65, and I, I was about 65 at that time, and I was looking at beyond that, but I used that. And I see Pranav, my son is out there, who's a co-founder of Charya. And Pranav 
put the word 65 back to it. I, I, I think it's got something to do with a quarterback or whatever. I have no idea what it means. But anyhow, a 65 back and that's stuck. And so we call it a 65 back process where you visualize in, in a totality, in a much larger holistic space of beyond just purely the power and wealth that we normally aspire, which is what I was aspiring to throughout my career and my first 50 years of my life, to other things which are extremely important to us, health to start with, relationships, serving other people, things which are joyful, learning, and a larger spiritual purpose, et cetera. So many of you who've been through my cohorts and some of the other work that we have done on Create Your Future know this. So the reason why I'm saying it is with the Create Your Future, you create a vision for the future, which is kind of a legacy that you want to leave and you want to live, becomes your purpose. You already establish something that you would like to do with your connection of your passion and your strengths. You have some short-term goals and you have this future and you walk back from the future to about the same period as your short-term goals, which is about three to five years. And you'll find invariably, if you're honest with yourself, gaps. So fulfilling the gaps becomes your intent and you creatively visualize it. There are multiple processes we teach. And so this is something I want to take up more, much and more seriously. I was talking to Peter about this and he said, it's a brilliant idea. And this is so beautifully bringing together what the universe wants in a way of you, which is a true meaning and purpose of it. Those of you who are from India and familiar with it would know that's a prarabdha karma, which is the pattern, possibility set that you are born with. And what is it that you try and do in your life? Like the Yoda said, don't just try it, do it. And therefore, once you are clear about it, you start doing it. Now comes the surprising part. So about a few months ago, um, my daughter Chaitra, she also happens to be in this program. <laughs> she told me, and she, they both of them, son and daughter, both are PCC. So uh, Chaitra told me that, look, why don't you watch this particular Coursera uh, program by Professor Laurie Santos? which has been the most popular program at Yale. So I went there and I was absolutely amazed. And then she refers to, of course, Martin Seligman, who's a, and I'm coming back to my son and daughter, but it's, it's, it's real. Pranav had recommended that I read Martin Seligman about seven, eight years ago, learned optimism, and I became a great fan of Martin Seligman. And uh, Martin Seligman conducts another program at UPenn, which is something to do with authentic happiness and so on. Now. The brilliant part of it is what we teach at Create Your Future is exactly what they are teaching. And the great part of it is, unlike me, who's an ignoramus, they are able to come together with tremendous amount of research and statistical background and studies and say, hey, this is why it works. So Martin Seligman has some very, very simple tests on his uh, website. You can go to Authentic Happiness or Martin Seligman, Lou Penn, wherever you want to go. Please, I seriously advise every one of you to take that. One is called PERMA, which is P-E-R-M-A, whatever it stands for. It's about happiness. And the other is what is called significant strengths. And then there's some way there, which is exactly what we do in Create Your Future. You get this bunch, which is your happiness creation factors, triggers, on the other side, you have strengths and coming together, they create the pathways that you can follow. What are the opportunities? So I would like to start from there because that is what, <clears throat> in a sense, any systemic approach does. The systemic approach is not just about ourselves. Neha, you asked me, so sorry, it took me about 10 minutes to get to the point. But the point is the systemic approach is not really about yourself. The systemic approach is about you living in this world, this universe amongst other people, influenced by them, constantly interacting with them. And together, are you coming to this balance between yourself, something like a homeostasis or whatever you might want to call it, 
between yourself and other people and how well are you able to do it. So if you're going to be too greedy and just wanting, I want to grab, grab, grab the Trumpian way, that's one thing which is sure to lead to your destruction and of other people. Or, okay, others want from me and therefore I'm willing to sacrifice. There are many of us who go the other path. And at the end of it, you find that uh, you're sacrificing a lot of life for other people, but you don't get anything done for yourself. And therefore, maybe you make other people happy. Perhaps you do, perhaps you don't. But you yourself are not living in a happy space. So the midpoint somewhere, the noble, great, wise Buddha said, is a middle path where you are able to integrate that what you want with what the ecosystem, the universe, or whoever wants. That's really where the beauty lies, where the happiness lies, the authentic happiness lies, where you can exhibit your strength. So I'll stop here for a moment. Puja, you have joined us, uh, Neha as well. So beyond this, if there are any questions or if there is anything else out on the chat, uh, from which uh, you can pick up something. Uh, I'll, I'll stop for a while. Thank you, Ram. It's lovely <laughs> to hear you elaborate on a topic. You know, that's why we're here at a webinar, a long form webinar. You know, we're not trying to put a tweet together where we actually want to take the scenic route. You know, <laughs> we don't want to take the shortcut to the destination. So thank you for that. Uh, Pooja, hi, welcome. Everybody, this is Pooja. I'm sure you've seen her around. She's one of our lovely coach trainers. And uh, she specializes in organizational coaching. And um, Pooja, I'd love to hear uh, your take. Also, how are you doing? <laughs> uh, well, I'm doing well, thanks. My first few words early in the morning. So joining you all from Vancouver, Canada. So just waking up. Uh, thanks to Ram and the group. Um, what a lovely way of, uh, you know, you've so rightly said the scenic way that Ram takes us into understanding that uh, whole deep dive of uh, systemic coaching. So if I may uh, share my um, two cents and continue on Ram's uh, scenic route, I would say that um, he has so well articulated that um, it's an integration of who we are with the world. And I would say that I'll add to the analogy of um, uh, using the breath. You know, we breathe in and we breathe out. So what is the system doing for us and how do we contribute to that system? And that is that breathe in and the breathing out. So as a coach, as uh, people within any system, whether it is an organizational system, a family system, or we work within so many multitudes of systems, but coming from, let's say the organization lens, my focus has always been that success. And when Ram says happiness is about how the system is working for you and how you work within and for that system. So it's that breathing in and breathing out. I'll stop there um, and let the conversation bubble. Thank you, Pooja. Thanks a lot, that's lovely. Um, so since we are talking about organizational, uh, you know, systemic coaching, but within the context of an organization, I'm curious to know what, um, what, what do you feel is going on these days? Like if you were to, you know, put your fingers on the pulse of organizations and corporate culture these days, like what is it that you would sense and what is coming up in these like uncertain times? So much is changing. Um, you know, we're, 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 so many organizations are no longer meeting in person. And then you've got organizations like Ocharya, we've never met in person. <laughs> and, and so we're chugging along, but you know, everyone is feeling that there's a lot of emotion. There's a lot of things going on for a lot of people. And um, there's, there's some fragmentation, there's all these things, but how, how are you experiencing this? What's your take on it? And where does uh, systemic coaching kind of play into that? Just asking the easy questions. Yeah, well, I'm not personally experiencing anything because I'm 
quite used to being my, myself and doing the virtual work. But what I'm experiencing around me with many people, and there are many of people I recognize here who are running fairly large companies who are involved in one thing or another. I think what in the last three years has happened is, first of all, a clear realization that we are not in control. A tiny microbe, whatever you might want to call it, a virus has taken control and there's nothing that really we can do about it. How it's going to end, we don't know yet. Sure, we feel at this point in time, oh, we are almost licked it. Maybe we have, maybe we haven't. But certainly for three years, we've been taken around on a merry-go-round. And this is clearly demonstrated that there is nothing absolutely permanent. There is nothing that the human kind, the human mind, that can say that we are totally in control. Now, as a consequence, many things are happening where maybe the concept of work from home, maybe the freedom that we have tasted. So there is today uh, a wave of uh, exits, resignations, or whatever it is. People say, hey, if you don't want, don't allow me to uh, work the way that I want from home. I don't want to work with you. So you are happening, uh, you are seeing today, and certainly I'm looking at it from India, but I'm sure all over the world. And I saw it today, I'll just quote that uh, because I see that Akil from Amazon is here. I, Amazon has just announced that they have doubled the salary limits for various grades, saying that we are now willing to pay more to hire people because we don't have them. And in institutes of management in India, every one of them, instead of the normal six days of uh, the festival that they have in terms of recruitment, the circus that goes on, the first two days, um, the class has been exhausted. So companies are desperate to get talent. And I, I think it's fantastic. Finally, the worm has turned. It's not the employer, the big guy sitting out there who's controlling you. The small guy who is saying, hey, I'm in control. I can decide where I wish to go. And that is happening certainly in the corporate space. And usually the corporate space is the bellwether for what's going to happen elsewhere. And this is certainly going to happen in our political and social scenes. All these big fat politicians are corrupt. Uh, I don't want to use bad words, but those are the only things that come to my mind at this point in time who are creating this horrible scenario of intolerance and everything else in this country and everywhere else. And they are going to get their comeuppance because people are going to say to hell with you. And this is not the way we want it to be. So in a sense, in a much, much larger sense, what's really happening, I think, and it's a great thing that is happening, is a disruption, which is creating a new culture. And it's no longer about the changes. I mean, earlier we used to talk about VUCA and this, that, what are those fancy terms? But change is permanent. Every day is a change. There's nothing certain for tomorrow. And that's how really our life was envisaged by the great scriptures. But you don't know, we are talked about breath. You don't even know when you're, if it, the next exhalation, it stops and there is no inhalation, that's it. Thank you, bye-bye. And you either get burnt or you get buried or whatever happens to you. So that could quite possibly happen even I'm speaking. I don't want to be morbid, but the point is that it's, it's certainly a reality and that, that we are realizing more and more. And therefore, if you want to live a life to the full, if you want to live a life in the present moment, the only way that we can live it is systemic. And to me, systemic in that sense equals spirituality. And it truly is spiritual because you're really talking not just about yourself, you're talking about all that is around you, not just your family, but a much larger community, a much larger ecosystem, the climate and everything else. And so the, the systemic approach is not just one, two or three circles. It's an ever expanding circle. You start with the individual, then you might come into groups and teams and you might come into minor communities and you might come into a larger institution that you can come into the ecosystem and ultimately it might be the ever expanding universe the uni universe is constantly expanding as we know now 
So that's really the totality of the concept of the system. Now, the question really is, I'm not going to be able to sit there like the Buddha or the Ramana or the Ramakrishna or maybe like the way that Jesus lived his life. But in my own way, with my feet on the earth, but my head perhaps in the clouds, is there a way that I can integrate the two? And I do believe that in a very simple way, and I'm here borrowing from some of the stuff that uh, Professor Laurie Santos and Martin Seligman and others are saying and what we know from our scriptural work as well. Can we be good to each other? Can we be respectful? Can we be loving? Can we be compassionate? The words that the Dalai Lama uses. And is it very difficult? And very surprisingly, those of you who might have probably gone through Laurie Santos's this program in Yale, which is, I believe, the most popular and the highest attended program in Yale for two centuries or whatever. The words that she uses are, which many people till about a few years ago, they said, what mumbo jumbo, what nonsense. Kindness, gratitude, acceptance, love, compassion. And these are to graduate students in UAL Business School and others. And these are guys who are looking at 100,000, 150,000 salaries as soon as they leave. And she says, that's not going to satisfy you, buddy. Okay. And she stores shows statistics in the US, if you have a $70,000 salary, that's where your satisfaction ends. After that, it's greed. So if you get a job for 100,000, within six months, you are going to think, I want 150. And if you get 150, I want 250. And these are shown by statistical uh, evidence. And if you think your likes and dislikes on Instagram and social media, Facebook, or whatever it is, is going to make your life, that's a whole lot of another BS. And, and first of all, there's a decremental satisfaction when these things happen. And second of all, there's clear evidence to show that what we think is going to bring us happiness has nothing to do with what really brings us happiness. Material acquisitions, things like my power, my position, my wealth, and all that kind of a stuff. We think that if we get there, we are going to be so much happier. And if I don't, I'm going to be here. Actually, she is able to show evidence and it's surprising, it shocked me and all of you should actually see it for yourself. That whether you achieve it, don't achieve it, whatever happens, it's all within a very small range. There's hardly any difference. There's something that's very deep in our mind system, which accepts the fact that you are okay, whatever you are. And this is really, for those of you who are familiar with it, is a message of the Gita. Don't get obsessed with what you want to achieve. Just enjoy the journey and the leave in that space. Krishna as the God incarnate, he says, leave it to me, doesn't matter, but let it be. Just do what you have to do. So I think in another sense, that is what it is. So, I mean, putting it slightly in a different perspective, one of the things that we do in our programs these days is try and tell you coaching is not anything mystical. It's not any kind of a rocket science. You're all practicing it, every one of you, as leaders or mothers or parents or whatever, every day. You have a clear intent to do something. And in order to get it done, especially if you're interacting with somebody else, you have to build up a relationship with them. You have to communicate with them in some way. You have to understand their emotional states and so on. And then eventually, both you and the other person create a certain awareness, understanding, and then you move into action. And that's what coaching is about. It's about the stages of an initial intent creation. It's about a stage of building a relationship, it's a stage of communication, and finally, it's about a stage of creating awareness and action and anchoring it. That is all there is to it in coaching. 
And let's say if you're a corporate leader, in every meeting, which you're already quite familiar with, if you're doing it well, you certainly go with a specific intent. You go with an agenda. What are we going to discuss? Why are we going to discuss? And how we do you know at the end of it that we are going to have a successful meeting or not? And what's going to be challenging in terms of what we are trying to achieve? And that's really what the contracting and coaching means. And then as you discuss with one another, you are empathetic, you are curious, you are generative, trying to towards getting the right thing that you've decided. And that is all about building relationship and communication. And then you create awareness of what are the things that are blocking us. And then you work towards what needs to be done. So if you are trained the right way in management, like I was in my alma mater for work, uh, which was Unilever, that automatically comes to you. The other day I was in some thing, I, I was mentioning this and uh, Magda said, what are you talking about? Which world do you come from? <laughs> anyway, but that's a world I come from. Uh, something like Unilever, where this was our staple. This is what we were taught. How do you run a meeting? If you are able to get that right, and then if you work with your subordinate in a way that there is an empathetic generative conversation that's about a performance review, and you don't do it once a year, you do multiple times a year, six times a year, whatever times a year, and you ask them, okay, what did we agree together? What you think you have done? And then add my two bits to it and then say, what can I do you to help you do better, do differently? These are very, very simple things which can create a coaching culture in an organization. And the moment you start doing it, you automatically create the potential for leadership. So it aligns, becomes congruent with leadership development. That's all really you have to do. And that's a systemic approach because you're working with a group of people and what you have at interest is a larger system, the organization, as well as a larger group, the group of people that you are working with. You don't need to do anything differently. So again, I'll, I'll stop here. Uh, if there are any questions that are coming up, any questions coming up for either of you. Thank you, Ram. Uh, Pooja, is there, is there anything you would like to add or anything you would like to check? Sure, I was busy trying to respond to one of our participants' uh, question, which is so relevant around um, a systemic lens within organizational coaching. And I would reiterate what Ram said that COVID in my assessment has been the biggest catalyst needed within the organizational uh, scene. Um, you know, it has given rise to what is working for individuals because now they know that they can work and contribute in a different scenario and businesses are needing to rejig, rework their business models. Um, and so when the two come together, it is the most, I would say, poignant and potential space for systemic coaching to happen because now you are recreating a way of the new way of existing, both for the individual, individuals coming together, and as a, a collective organization. So this is such a, a, let's say, you know, it's like clay on a sculptor's wheel. And that's where systemic coaching can have the biggest impact and organizational coaching as well. Because when we talk about systemic coaching, I would say that it is part of an organizational coaching concept. Because like Ram said, there is group coaching, there is team coaching, there is so much about individual coaching as well that goes on in that you know, realm of organizational coaching. So absolutely great time for um, organizations to look at how coaching will take them to the next level, uh, whether organizations like Amazon and all forward-looking um, institutions, how do they leverage the individual values and what they are looking forward to and what an organization needs. So, you know, both of the bottom lines have to come together. No better place than coaching and the systemic organizational lens. 
That's great, Pooja. I love, I love that you call COVID a catalyst, first of all. I think that's such an interesting like, reframe and interesting way to look at how it has affected um, you know, all of us, but also just uh, the corporate world. And, uh, you know, I think um, Ram mentioned the great resignation earlier, you know, how just it's just not enough. It's just simply not enough to have a consistent paycheck. Um, and that, uh, you know, it, because of the remote hybrid model and, and like all these different changes and, and um, disruptions, uh, I think managers, managers seem to have like now a really critical role in uh, enhancing and kind of maintaining the health of an organization, um, it, you know, to like kind of foster a sense of belongingness, have a shared vision, and um, if if that if that isn't really there, then people tend to leave pretty quickly. Is is what I've, I, I'm also noticing just around me. Um, you know, I, I live in Gurgaon. It's it's a corporate hub here, uh, and. Uh, I'm noticing that in my peer groups as well. So in terms of practicality, you know, um, how, how does one start to apply these principles or get the conversation going in, in a corporate setting? You know, as a manager, say, um, how, how do we begin to address these things? How do we start the conversation on these things if it hasn't yet? If I was to jump in on this, I would say that uh, in my experience uh, where uh, the work I do is supporting individuals and in promoting their careers. And so it seems to be a very individualistic lens that you want to enhance your career, but essentially within an organization, it isn't, it is a systemic approach. So it's not just what you want, but it is what the organization needs. And how do you create that need for uh, what you, uh, what is the value you bring? So if I use that as an example, I would say that um, wherever the person is in the organization, to first trust that you are at a vantage point, and to discover what is that vantage point. You may not be a manager; you may just be an employee. But I think every individual is a leader. You lead. Uh, the work you do, you lead your uh, individual career, etc. So, yes, um, at a very strategic level, if an organization has to be impacted uh, as a culture, it needs to begin from the top, and um, uh, those who you know the senior leadership needs to really understand experience and uh, impact through coaching. But I would say that. That's not a battle lost if we don't have that vantage and we are not there. Wherever we are, be the change you want to see in the world and wherever you may be, you can bring about that um, shift in what is the value you are creating and figure out a way to impact the organization and have uh, the co-creation, so to say. So. Um, Ram, what are your thoughts? Yeah, uh, Gopal has made a comment here, and I remember recently I was reading some <clears throat> research work on meaning of work and satisfaction at work. And one of the things that came up, they did a survey with multiple people in an organization. And there was this person in a hospital who was like a cleaner. And the way that person, he or she expressed herself was that when I clean up the room and I do all this work, I'm not thinking about just my job is to clean and leave it like this, but what is the impact that it's going to have on the patient? What is the impact it's going to have on the environment? What's the impact that it's going to have on the hospital and the way things are done in a larger way? And that person, despite the job that she held, in terms of a happiness, she was one of the persons who found extraordinary meaning in that. But the levels, she said, when I do that, sometimes I come across a patient who says, oh, please help me do this or whatever it is. 
I don't stop to think that this is not part of my job description. And I start helping that patient. And then I get into trouble. Because my supervisor then turns around and says, this is not what you're supposed to do. Now, they measure the happiness of that supervisor. That supervisor didn't think her job was very meaningful. So ultimately, it really boils down to how do you look at the work that you're doing as a chore or is it something that you genuinely enjoy doing? And Gopal, you are absolutely right. It doesn't make a difference in terms of whether you are at the lower level of an organization or the higher levels of an organization. It's about how you work with a larger sense of purpose and what the larger system needs. And here, I do not want to define organization as an endpoint in a system. Very often, we seem to think just because I work for this organization, whatever that company is, whether Unilever for me or something else for someone else, is the ultimate end. But that organization itself is part of a larger subsystem. It could be an industry space, it could be a country, it could be whatever else it is. And that in turn belongs to a larger system and so on, you, you keep expanding into it. So unless we are conscious of it, how are we, even as an organization, how are we impacting people and how those people impact us? And which is what in systemic approach we call the larger system of stakeholders who are from future back. That means they could be our potential customers in future, potential stakeholders in the future or outside in that they may not be within the organization, interacting with the organization, but could be somewhere else. And this was something which came out very, very explicitly in a conversation I had with uh, Economic Times So somebody arranged this for some top 20 odd leaders to work with me for, I don't know, six to eight weeks or 10 weeks in India. And one of the guys said, when we are talking about this kind of an approach, he said, Look, I run a company which is into warehousing. And now I find that the people who are in the community of the warehouses, they are an important stakeholder because earlier we couldn't even care. We don't even know who, who they are. But more recently, because of the pandemic, they have come up and said, no, no, we don't want to allow these trucks to come in here. All this work is going on. It's affecting us. We could get affected. And so we need to go the extra mile to make sure that things are right and they are stakeholders. So many more such things may come up in the future as well. And for many companies, the blue ocean strategy in terms of what is going to be in the longer term, who are going to be our clients. So in some ways, if we look at the systemic approach in a much more planned way in terms of stakeholders of the future, not merely about what we had in the past and what we have now, and people who are much outside that system, many more layers beyond that. And that becomes congruent with what is called the scenario planning. And the scenario planning is something that can take you 20 years ahead. And there are many very famous companies in the world, Royal Shell, for example, and many other companies which have practiced scenario planning for a long time. But anybody today can really take a systemic approach and look five years or 10 years ahead of time to see what's likely to be the new triggers for us. All that you really need to do is to talk to more stakeholders who may not be today your stakeholders, but who may potentially be your stakeholders in the future. They may be the children of your current customers, perhaps even your grandchildren, the grandchildren of your current customers. Now, all this means some effort, but for many companies, this is going to be the differential that is going to make them either successful or failures. So uh, that, that's what I want to leave with. Uh, we have a few minutes more. I don't know if there are any other questions that are coming up here. Pusha, you wrote something in the chat. Um, which is, so the next question is given we have this space, 
What is your readiness to influence the system for mutual success? Are you referring to, you know, wherever you are in the organization, what we were talking about earlier, that you have the power to affect change or to just start wherever you are and, and just consider that question as to what is your readiness to? Uh, yes, and uh, it's both the readiness in terms of skills and the readiness in terms of your own approach and thinking. Um, because when we do know, you know, if we go from um, the previous intention of what is needed and what is not happening, then we are not able to break through the silos or we are not able to break through those barriers. But as we said, while, due to COVID, the past three years have really been teaching uh, opportunities, both for individuals and organizations. So while we do notice that at an individual level, we are changing, we are becoming more aware, I am throwing that out that uh, what is making us believe that organizations aren't. There are organizations who are waking up to this new reality and perhaps even questioning so what next? How do we do it? Maybe they are coming from that growth perspective. So considering and giving that benefit of doubt, we need to be ready to impact and you know, bring that uh, change to form something new. And that can only happen when we do have the adequate skills as well. Uh, to impact that change. So what I mean is getting those uh, uh, coaching skills, getting those perspectives that we at Kocharya are, uh, you know, providing. So it's both uh, the individual and the organization. I think everyone is ready. I think this, um, there is a reason why we are having this conversation today, else we would not be out into social media talking about it and having such a large uh, audience, you know, participation. So there is that readiness. It, it, the spaces have opened. What are we now uh, able to do? Yeah, you're right. I mean, it, certainly there, there does seem to be that movement and that shift. And that's why we have people like Akhil, you know, here in the audience, we have, um, you know, we, we were going to have Mahesh here and it's, it's clear that people are, are waking up to that. Um, now, when we, again, when we're talking about, you know, how can I make a change? Is that already a flawed thinking? Because if we're talking about systemic change, isn't that, it, doesn't it go deeper than that? How can we as individuals affect that? I mean, the collective is made up of individuals, but you see where I'm going with this? I maybe, I'm not too sure, mm. but uh, what I'm, what's coming up for me is, I think what Ram and we've been talking about, that it's about working on oneself too and paying attention. It is, again, I go back to the initial analogy of breathe in, breathe out. It isn't just one exhale and it isn't just one breathing in. It is that constant paying attention to how is the universe, the system in which we are operating um, changing with every impact we are making. And I see you closing your eyes and you know that's that introspection as well as the impact that needs to happen concurrently. Um, in coaching, we talk about presence. We talk about listening. Uh, Ram talked about the three levels, Otto Shamar's ways of listening. And that is the core. You know, are we listening from an open mind as well as an open will and everything in between? Because that's when we are impacting and co-creating. Co-creating means we are transforming together with the system. It doesn't mean we are static and we are, uh, you know, creative best. It means that we are transforming with the system. So how do we move that along? How do we move that dial along that works for both? Beautifully, beautifully put, Pooja. Thank you for that. Thank you for also catching my question. You know, I was kind of, uh, I wasn't aiming very well, but you caught it anyway. So I really appreciate that. Um, and you, you talked about readiness, right? And then you also said that you think that we're all ready. 
um, which which sounds really hopeful and beautiful. But at the same time, when you talk about readiness and having certain mm. skills, uh, you know, to to develop and to hone in order to you know participate in the systemic change, what are some of those skills, and how can we be better, even if we are ready? So my easy answer is coaching. My easy answer is coaching competencies. Uh, when I say we are ready, we would not be thinking, you know, when I, uh, when I get the opportunity to train a cohort, I know that there is that readiness because there wouldn't be the question and no one would be ready to invest their time, energy, resources to um, think about, so what is this uh, whole area of coaching. So today we are spending one hour together. There, this is a proof of readiness. What is then needed is the deeper dive, both into the art and what I call art and science of coaching. Science is the skills. Come join us in any of our electives. You know, all of us are here um, imparting our experience and knowledge and that knowledge is the science and then the art is that constant practice I call it the mindset you know competencies also talk about the mindset it is how we work on ourselves every day we don't need to be the coach in the room we need to be listening like a coach so the coach approach, the big C, the small C's in all our organizations, in mine as well, we say, are you doing big C coaching? Are you doing so small C coaching? And all of that creates an organization that is listening to each other. So that's the skill that I talk about. Thanks, Pooja. Uh, is there anything you would like to add, Ram? Above and beyond that, what are some of the skills that we need in order to be ready for this kind of change? And how can we develop them? Okay. Um, to me, when we ask a question about are people ready, it's like, have you stopped beating your wife? You know, uh, no one is going to admit that they're not ready. The question really is, are we even aware of what's happening around us? Now, Pooja referred to Otto Sharma. Otto Sharma's study shows that uh, fully 80% of us are blind. We have a closed mind, we have a closed heart, we have a closed will on multiple things. So if you look at it from that perspective, I don't think any of us is ready. But the good news is maybe there are 20% who are willing to open up and see. So there are interventions that are possible, be it the theory you kind of labs or the kind of work that we are doing, or whether it is coaching in a larger sense, which is not merely about that elite coaching or one-to-one, -one, which is at a much larger level with a systemic approach. It needs to create that concept. It needs to create that awareness that there are things happening around us. And I'm not talking about just our executive things. There is intolerance around us. There is injustice around us. Now the question is like Peter Hawkins used to ask this question, what were the coaches doing when the banks were collapsing and when something else was burning? The same question in every one of our countries, there are things which are happening, which are horribly wrong. So what are we doing? If we are truly ready, we would rise up against that, are we? So that readiness depends upon each individual to answer for themselves. What are they doing for it? Even if they are just speaking out, whether they are writing about it or experiencing it and talking to a few people. But most of us would rather be safe in our cocoons and be comfortable with that. And we would be unwilling to upset the environment around us. And that's really the danger because that is going to affect you any which way. The intolerance between one religion and another will then spill over to intolerance within groups of people within that religion and within that group and so on and so forth till the intolerance and the hatred is going to take over. The only answer to that is tolerance, compassion, love, etc. Is that something that we are able to promote in a systemic way, in a spiritual way? It is really a measure of our readiness. 
And to be very honest, I don't know. I mean, Puja is optimistic. I'm not. Today, if I look around the situation around me, uh, yeah, surely something needs to happen. But uh, is that happening? If each one of us sort of makes our effort, maybe something will happen, which is why people like Otto Sharma are doing what we, they are doing, what is, whatever we are doing in these kind of webinars is to promote that uh, need for something to open up our minds and so on and so forth. So I'll just leave it here. We are just about uh, on top of that. No, I just, yeah. I want to just add yeah. one point to what Ram just said. What occurred for me while he was saying that is even to find a voice and how do we say what we really want to say is, um, is a coaching skill. It, uh, coaching is not just about asking questions. It is showing up uh, ready to listen. It is showing up um, ready to um, you know, uh, speak your heart and mind in a way that another person can listen. So creating those spaces. So I think what he's saying is so well, um, um, at least for me, it was a realization that, um, yeah, finding, it's not just saying and um, uh, voicing yourself, but how do you put this across that people listen? So thanks, Ram. That's so true. Yeah. Anyway, I mean, it's, it's, it's a never-ending never existential question. Um, so... Yeah, I, I, I can afford to say it where my expiry date is closed, so I don't have much to worry about if anything goes wrong. <laughs> but for many other people, if I were 30 years younger, probably I would have some reservations about saying what I honestly feel. So I'm not as brave as I appear to be. <laughs> it is more that my situation allows me to say what I feel like without having to worry too much about it. But the point is, you're right. Each one of us has to be that strong listener and in a way, uh, the, the coach in that sense where you are aware of what is going on around you and you are willing to listen and willing to sort of say something which uh, is authentic and congruent, but at the same time in an appropriate way, using the Kaldrigerian approach. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think we have reached the time for our session. Thank you. Thanks a lot, everyone. I think I think it's beautiful that we ended on this note, you know, and also just saying not categorizing people as optimistic or pessimistic, but I think just having that nuance, having that richness of complexity, allowing ourselves to be a little bit more complex than that. And you know, what comes, what really is coming up for me is also no matter what your stance may be or no matter what your approach may be, I think if we just still like, just remain curious as the future unfolds, we can, um, we'll, we'll figure it out. No, we'll figure it out. We Let's make our sessions controversial. <laughs> yeah. Okay, take care. Bye, all the best, all of you who stayed okay. through the session. Bye. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks, yeah. Pooja. Thanks, Neha. Have, Thank have you very a great much indeed. Evening, day, and once again, night. apologize for Mahesh not being able to be here on his behalf. Thank you. Bye bye. We Thank compensated, so. didn't we, Ram? <laughs> <laughs> Surely. Controversy. We did. But probably there are people who expected Mahesh here. So I'm, I'm, I'm so apologizing for that. Yeah. Thank yes. you. Bye bye. That's true. Okay. Right. Bye -bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you, Pooja. Thank you, Ram. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. A great day.